Okay. Let's see. Hopefully. This is going. One second, if this is streaming, I will get this started in just a second. say something to let me know you can hear me. We'll get started. Does the audio sound good and all that? This is my first time streaming this thing. Okay. So today, we're looking at uh, PCR as the main thing, but we're going to be going over PCR, primer design, uh, how to look up gene sequences, and how to use SnapGene. So we've got a few different things to cover. The first thing is sort of the basics of PCR. PCR is a really, really useful and important technique in, um, in um, okay the best I can do for the lagginess. I'm working on that. Um, PCR is a really important technique in uh, biotech and it's used in a lot of different things. So the, the fundamental idea is it allows you to copy specific pieces of DNA in a very controlled way. And so that gives you a lot of, uh, a lot of ability to learn things so you can not only physically make copies that you can use, um, yeah, I definitely need more bandwidth. Um, is it understandable at all? Is it? Let's see. Well, 
just gonna hope some people can hear me. So, PCR gives you the ability to make physical copies of small pieces of DNA. And you can use that uh, in a lot of different ways. You can use that, okay, as long as the sound is good. Um, so you can use that to uh, sequence things, you can use that to assemble uh, things, you can take a gene out of one organism and pop it into a plasma. There's a lot of things you can do with that. So we're gonna go over sort of how that's done. Now, on the physically, uh, or on the, on the physical level, you have DNA, and you remember as we talked about last week, it's a double-stranded uh, piece of DNA, and the two, st the two strands are connected by hydrogen bonds. And so, let me see if I can do the screen capture. Okay. All right, so, this little guy here, which is sort of the paperwork we were using. So, you can see this double-stranded piece of DNA, right? And then, uh, to, to make this PCR reaction happen, what you're gonna do is you're gonna heat it up, and then the two pieces of DNA will separate, and then you have another smaller piece of DNA that you add that's called a primer, and we'll talk about primers in a minute. And then you have enzymes that you use to extend those primers, and because those enzymes use the, uh, the melted piece or the, the template piece of DNA as, as the template, and remember we talked about base pairing, so we talked about um, A and T uh, bind together and C and G bind together. So if there's an A, then it will put a T across from it. So as it builds this new molecule, it will uh, use this one as a template and it'll end up with a copy of the original. And then you do the whole thing again and you melt them and you make more copies and you melt them and you make more copies. And every time you're doubling, so you get a chain reaction and it's an exponential increase. So after just a few cycles, like 30 cycles, you can get billions of copies of the same piece of DNA. And so in a very short period of time, an hour less, you can make a huge amount of a very specific piece of DNA. Now, um, let's see, if we, check back over here, okay, cool. So if we look at um, the, there's some important things to bear in mind though. So when you're talking about uh, DNA, you're talking about a, a polymer, so it's a strand of nucleotides. And so when you're gonna try and build more of it, there are things that you're gonna need in your reaction. The main thing obviously is more nucleotides to build DNA out of. And those nucleotides will be assembled in a particular direction. And so it's always assembled from the five prime end to the three prime end. And remember DNA is, uh, is antisense. So you have this five prime end on this side and then you go down and it's the three prime end. Then on the other side, the, the complementary strand, it's five prime end is over here and it travels in the antisense direction to the three prime end over here. So that's gonna be a big, big part of how you have to think about primer design. So it's important that you get that in your head because when you uh, separate these two strands, you won't be using the same primer. You'll have two distinct primers. One will be the forward primer and one will be the reverse primer. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about that. Now, if you go down in your uh, PCR guide, you'll see uh, the, the basic steps, how you actually achieve that. And the first thing is just denaturation, so that's just heating it up. Uh, the hydrogen bonds will break after they're stressed enough, um, and that happens just by, uh, just by heat, and then the molecule has enough energy to sort of rip itself apart. Those are pretty weak bonds. But the backbone structure is much stronger, and so it won't damage the DNA really to be heated up that much. So you heat your DNA up, they separate, and now you have all the DNA is separated. So the primers are unbound, the template is unbound from itself, and now you're gonna take uh, and you're gonna add your primers. So let's give it sort of a, a, an example for more context. So let's say you wanted to uh, amplify the DNA of a dog. You have a dog and you wanna check something in his genome. 
So what you do is you collect some DNA, uh, you collect some cells, you do a process to extract the DNA, and then you would add that to a tube. And in that tube you would put a mix of um, uh, reagents and enzymes and uh, primers that would allow you to, to do this. So the first thing you're going to need to do uh, is you're going to heat the thing, and then you're going to have uh, your primers, which will go over the design, anneal, and extend, and as they extend, you'll get more and more and more copies, and what you'll end up with is a small amount of template DNA and a whole lot of your amplicon, your amplified piece of PCR DNA. And so when you're trying to uh, design a PCR reaction, you've got to keep sort of the, the general context in mind. But, let's see, so let's go like this. So the steps are, um, Oh, excuse me. Uh, let's see. Okay, so some things to bear in mind. Let's see. see the screen. Okay, so let's go through and say we're going to do this reaction. Um, the PCR reaction is, uh, hold on one second. see me? Okay, so we've got our, is that better or is it better with the uh, graphics? Let me know if that's terrible, or if you would rather see the graphics. But y'all have this guide as well. Um, so what you're going to do uh, is you're going to uh, you're going to make a, a mixture. And what you're going to have is you're going to have a set of reagents. Uh, the first reagent is going to be your master mix. Uh, generally, this is going to have uh, screen sharing seems not laggy. Okay, I'll switch back to screen share. Okay. All right. So. Uh, you're going to have a, a master mix. Now the master mix is a mix of things like um, it's got the, the polymerase enzyme, which is the enzyme that actually binds to the, uh, the primer and the template DNA and extends. It's, it's a polymerase, so it, it makes this polymer, it makes the DNA. And so uh, the polymerase that we use is a polymerase called TAC polymerase or variations of TAC. And so um, uh, it's named after Thermus aquaticus, which is T A Q TAC, and that was named uh, because they actually discovered or they they collected this polymerase from an, uh, a bacteria in I think it was Yellowstone. But basically, uh, it's a thermally stable polymerase. So it's a polymerase that can handle the heat of a PCR reaction. Most polymerases just can't take the heat, and so they get uh, denatured, they get damaged by the heat. This one is from a hot spring dwelling uh, bacteria, so they're thermally stable. It's got some issues though. TAC polymerase, while it's thermally stable, it's not especially um, accurate compared to some other polymerases because it doesn't have proofreading activity. And so that means if it makes an error, it has no way to correct it. Other polymerases, uh, which you can buy sort of hybrid polymerases and they have like Q5 fusion things like that and they have proofreading activity which just means that they have what they call uh, 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease activity so the, the gist of that is if they're going along and they put the wrong base pair so it sees a T and instead of adding an A it adds like a G if it does that, then that's it doesn't bind properly, and you don't get um, uh, you don't get the the complementary base pair sequence, 
And so it actually can back up a step, remove that one, and then put the right one down. And so those polymerases tend to be more expensive. Um, and for some applications, they're needed if you're going to do something that where the sequence is long or where it's really, really important that it be accurate, then you can use those. But for most applications, especially short pieces of, of uh, DNA ampli amplification, TAC works great. Uh, it's cheap, it's easy to use, and it's sort of what all this was built on. So uh, TAC polymerase uh, is the enzyme. It will be part of the master mix. The master mix will have everything you need from the salts and uh, sort of all the chemistry that drives this thing because it needs ATP because it is uh, uh, an enzyme and it's doing work so it needs energy so it uses ATP it needs the uh, the actual nucleotides floating around in this uh, mix and it needs um, obviously the polymerase the TAC polymerase itself so when you have all those ingredients you can uh, you can use that now since all that's pretty standard that's not something that you change up very much you need to decide which polymerase you want to use and there are times when you might want to play with those, with the particulars of that um, set of reactions. So you may want to say, oh, well, it needs a little bit more of this, or it needs a little bit less of that, but that's very rare. Mostly you just use the master mix in the standard way, and it generally works pretty well. Um, the things that you need to do as far as designing your PCR reaction is you need to know what piece of DNA you're amplifying uh, and why in your template and then you need to design the primers. That's where most of this comes, uh, comes in. And designing the primers requires you to kind of understand uh, what's going on with, um, uh, with, with this system. So uh, designing primers is not too hard, um, and there's lots of automated systems that will do most of the work for you. And so, uh, oh, okay, here would have been a good thing to show. Uh, so the master mix, uh, generally has these components in them and so it's got uh, obviously not the template or the primers but it's got all these pieces right so this is the nucleotides water you don't have to dilute things uh, let's see now uh, let's see we'll do the steps okay let's go ahead and do the steps now then. so uh, the initial denaturation step, you'll do this in a thermocycler, uh, which I think everybody has. So the initial denaturation step, once you assemble your reaction, you've got your master mix, you've got your primers, you've got your template DNA, you've got your water, so it's diluted to the right uh, uh, quantity. And then you take your initial denaturation step, and usually that's 94C, but it can be as high as 98C, just depends, different protocols call for different things. And this initial step is just to make sure that everything's good and separated, especially long pieces of DNA, like genomic DNA, might take a little bit more time than normal to get them to separate. So you do one cycle of a very long two-minute uh, denaturing step. Then you immediately repeat the denaturing step again, same temperature, anywhere from here to 98, for usually a shorter time, in this case 15 seconds, but it can be a little longer. Then the annealing step. Now this is an important thing that you're going to have to think about. This is one of the things that you're going to uh, you're going to adjust when you're designing the reaction itself, and that comes down to the nature of the primer, because different primers uh, have different uh, binding energy, and so the binding energy of a primer is based on its sequence and its length. So if a primer is very long, it has a lot of hydrogen bonds and those hydrogen bonds stabilize and strengthen the bond of the primer, the little short piece of DNA that we're, we're using. Uh, it's an oligo, they call it, um, or an oligonucleotide. And they're usually about 20 bases long, though they can be much longer, 50 bases, 60 bases, depending on what you're doing. Usually, though, it's about 18, 20. When you take that um, primer, its sequence is complementary to uh, the template. So that means everywhere there's an A, there's a T on your primer, and everywhere there's a C, there's a G on your primer, and so on. So 
the complementary sequence is what allows it to bind. And the longer that sequence is, the more complementary bonds there are, the more stable it is, the more heat it takes to uh, make it separate. So there's an important uh, idea, uh, and it's the melting temperature. And a lot of people misunderstand this, but the, the, the TM that you'll see, the, the, the sort of theoretical melting temperature, is not the temperature at which all the primers melt away from the template. It's the temperature where half the primers are at equilibrium between melting away from the template and attaching. So if you're at the calculated TM and everything is exactly like they imagine in their calculations, uh, it should be half your primers are bound and half are unbound. And, there's an, and you would think you would just lower it so all your primers bind, but there's an issue, and that is that primers can bind to things that are similar sequence, but not exactly the same. And that's a problem because you will get, or you can get, PCR products that don't necessarily, um, uh, that don't necessarily reflect what you want, so it can amplify the wrong thing, or several of the wrong things. Um, and so if you want specificity, you raise that uh, temperature so that only some of your pri of your primers bind, and then if you want uh, sensitivity, you lower that temperature. And sometimes you have to kind of optimize that. So you have to sort of play with the temperature, and sometimes you can just generally put it at somewhere in between these two values, somewhere around 55, depending on how your primers are designed. And usually that works, but sometimes you have to lower it down, sometimes you have to raise it up. And this is one of the factors you're going to play with if you're having PCR problems. And then you'll give it some time, about 30 seconds, for the primers to anneal. So it's been really hot, all your DNA separated, it all came back together, your primers annealed, you gave them a little time, and so about half your primers are stuck, or a little bit more than half, because generally your annealing temperature is, depending on the polymerase, about three to five degrees below the TM, the, the melting temperature that's calculated, uh, though some polymerases actually uh, want you to go above that because, at least theoretically, they stabilize the primer on the um, thing. So to look at your polymerase because they, they have instructions for whether you should go above or below or how many degrees. And usually those are pretty accurate guides. So, uh, for, but for TAC, it's three to five degrees Celsius below the TM should be your melting temperature. Then you have the elongation step. And what drives the elongation step is the step at which the, um, the polymerase enzyme itself operates the most efficiently. So at 72C, TAC polymerase is optimally efficient and it will go along. Not all polymerases want that. Some like Q5 want you to do it at 68C. So also refer to the specific polymerase that you're using for your elongation temperature and the time that you give to your elongation temperature is going to depend on the length of DNA that you're trying to uh, make, basically. So uh, the elongation step has a rate. The polymerase operates at a certain speed, generally about one kilobase or 1,000 bases, 1,000 letters of DNA per minute. Uh, some claim to be much faster than that, but, you know, it depends on a lot of things, so generally, and with TAC, it's one kilobase per minute. So if you say, uh, I have a 1,000 base uh, piece of, pe of DNA that I want to copy, then you'll run it for a minute. If you have 2,000, you'll run it for two minutes. If you have 500, you'll run it for 30 seconds. And so you let your elongation step go based on the temperature stays the same in this case, but the length of time varies depending on the length of the product that you're trying to make, and that's based on the distance between the two uh, uh, between the two primers. Your final elongation step, that's just because PCR is not a perfect process, and so elongation is uh, primers are actually popping on and off during this step, and uh, polymerases aren't perfectly accurate, so you'll have a lot of uh, short uh, pieces that aren't fully elongated, so you give it a nice long elongation step. Um, but actually, one thing I should mention this cycle of three here so denaturation, 
annealing of the primers, elongation of the primers, is on a loop. So that's one cycle, and that'll theoretically double the amount of, of um, template DNA that you've copied. And then you'll run the cycler so that it does a loop, and you'll denature those, anneal new primers, to the, including the DNA you just made, and elongate, loop back, un denature, anneal new primers, make more denature, and every time you double it. And so 30 times is sort of an average. Uh, you can do it 35 times, sometimes even more, but generally about 30 times, 30 loops through this process is what it takes to make a lot more uh, DNA. Then you go through, once you've done the 30 loops, to your final elongation step, and you just do that once. Make sure everything's fully elongated, and then you can cool it down and store it for forever if your thermocycler do that, not all of them do that. Uh, or you can just set it for, you know, however long it takes you to get back. I usually set mine for 10 hours. Um, let's see. So, now we'll talk a little bit about primer design. So, this is a good example. So, you can see here this primer and this primer. Uh, imagine they're the sort of these ellipses here is, is one connected piece, right? So you'll notice that this primer has the same sequence as the top strand of DNA, and this primer has the same sequence as the bottom strand of DNA. And so as they separate, this primer will anneal to the top strand, and this primer will anneal to the bottom strand. And so this one will extend to the bottom strand, this one will extend to the top strand. After those pieces are made, this one will stick then to this newly extended primer because it'll cut cover that area and then you'll get this exponential increase so designing primers as far as um, uh, as far as what you do is fairly straightforward uh, I'm going to show you all a couple of different ways uh, so one is snap gene had this open, but I had to reboot my computer. And this is more useful for if you're designing PCR around something small. So if you're designing PCR around uh, a small piece of DNA, in this case, uh, just a, a fragment, or say you were amplifying a plasmid or something like that, I would come here I look at my sequence, this is a snap gene, you can download the viewer, and then you have the actual sequence of DNA. Now, if you're designing, so here's the primer that I made for this PCR reaction, and you can see I've got these 20 bases, and as you highlight, it'll start spitting out the melting temperature. And so you can see the calculated TM right there. Uh, and so that gives you an idea what it is. Now, they'll also make adjustments for things like the uh, the actual sequence. So the number of CG pairings will increase the TM. And your CG percentage, if it gets really high, uh, can throw things off. So the, the, the pairing between A and T and C and G is a little bit different because A and T have two hydrogen bonds and C and G have three hydrogen bonds. So uh, theoretically CG bonds are stronger than AT bonds. And so that means it needs more energy, more heat, to separate uh, uh, the primer from the template. So that means you need more, um, a higher melting temperature. So when you're calculating that, it looks at the primer uh, sequence and length. So the longer you get it, if I were to bring it out here, it just keeps getting higher and higher and higher, right? And eventually, it gets so high that it's it's just too much, and you can't really get PCR to work right. But um, the general temperature range is basically anywhere from like 50 to 60. Uh, this one's a little high because it has a lot of G's in it. But I didn't actually design this primer, I took it from a paper. That's one place you can get primers that you know work is papers where people have already done the troubleshooting for you. Um, but you could have designed it somewhere else. Now, one of the things, some of the sort of rules that you look at when you're designing primers, if let's say we wanted to amplify this region in the middle here, is you pick a spot that's obviously outside 
the, the region that you're trying to amplify, the thing you're trying to check, and you select it until you have a melting temperature in the range that you're looking for. And you try to end on the three prime end, because remember this is the top strand is the, the primer that I'm making. So the five prime end is over here, and the three prime end is over here. Now the three prime end is where the uh, tack polymerase will start to extend. So if this isn't bound well, if this end is sort of flailing about, then it won't be able to extend it. So the strength of this end is important. And so people tend to like to put CG pairs at the three prime end of their primers. Now with Snapgene, you can just go add primer, and you can use the top strand in this case, and then bam, there's your primer, right? So, and then if you wanted to do a reverse primer, you can come up here, and you can again get your melting temperature, let's do it around 60, uh, except it's ending with a T. So in this case, you're looking at the bottom strand, because now we're going to go up the antisense strand. So we're going to start with the CG over here. We're going to go there. And we're going to go primer, add primer. This time I'm going to use the bottom strand. And it's important that they be facing each other, because if I do this, this is the piece that will be amplified. right? So this primer will basically make a copy. Even though it's on the bottom, it'll anneal to the top, and then as it gets extended, it'll become identical to that bottom strand. This one on the top will anneal to the bottom, and as it gets extended, it will become identical to the top strand. So this, these two would make a very small 174 base pair uh, PCR reaction. So some things you need to bear in mind is remember, you want on the three prime ends, which is this end on the top strand, this end on the bottom strand. You want that to be a C or a G, ideally. You want it to be somewhere around uh, 60 degrees for a, a, a melting temperature. And you want it to be, um, and that means your annealing temperature is going to be about 55 degrees. And then you want it to be, um, you want to make sure that you have uh, not two top strands that are facing the same direction, and not two bottom strands that are facing the same direction. Because, for example, these two don't do an exponential reaction. This one would extend, and this one would extend, but they wouldn't uh, amplify each other. So, getting that down is important. And then you also want to make sure that the annealing temperature, or the, the, the TM, is not very different between the two primers. Because when you're actually setting up the reaction, you don't want one where the ideal melting temp or the ideal annealing temperature is 50, and the other the ideal melting temperature is 60, because then you're gonna you're gonna be not very ideal for either primer. And so you can select your primers this way, and then there are other considerations you have to make, because it is DNA, and if these two pieces have complementary sequences, they'll bind to each other, and then you'll get things like primer dimers and all sorts of other things, or they can even be self-complementary. So if the back end is palindromic to the front end, they can actually anneal and make these sort of loop structures that then won't stick to your template and won't do very much of anything. So there are uh, some places online where you can check that. Uh, IDT has some. Uh, you can take your primers and you can uh, go, you can just Google like primer design tools and they'll sort of computationally look over your primers and make sure things generally look okay. Um, and then you can set, take that and you can say, all right, here's my, um, uh, and there's other places where you can actually compare it to a template. Now, if you're not using a small piece like a, like a plasmid or something where you know the whole sequence and you just kind of look at it, and in this case, uh, this sequence is so short that Snapgene itself can look at it. If, the, if this piece was, if this sequence was repeated, then this primer would bind in three or four places. And I could see it. So right now it's got one binding site down here. But if it were a repeating sequence, it might have two or three, and that would create problems because it may amplify a lot of different things. Um, but when you're talking about a whole genome, SnapGene can't load that up. And so you need something a little bit bigger. And that's when you go to something like GenBank. Now GenBank is a government database. And so here's GenBank. Now GenBank 
uh, allows you to search all kinds of things. So let's say we were searching our dog. So we'll go gene, and we're going to look up a gene. Let's look up um, SLC2A9. That's a uric acid transporter gene. Okay. Solute carrier family 2. So in this case, we'll need to look at, we'll need to look for a specific organism. Uh, we can look at it in humans, uh, we can look at it in mice, chimps, whatever. Uh, so in this case, well, it doesn't matter, so we'll save time. We'll look at the human version. Okay, here's the Homo sapien version. We can click here. But normally, if you were looking for it for your dog, you would look for the dog one, but you get it. Okay, so. so here's the sort of human version of this gene. Here it is on chromosome 4. And we can do... stuff, there's the translation of various isoforms of it, but you know, if you go all the way down, oh, 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 I got the whole chromosome, hold on, oh, never mind, back that up, don't get the whole chromosome, you don't need it, I'm not using my touch screen, it's good for things up. This is one thing I don't like about this particular uh, website is it is not how I would have built it. Okay. No, back to the final assembly. Normally not this difficult. So, you can see, here's the gene, right? So that's the DNA sequence. So we can do this, pick primers. Now the nice thing about this is uh, it will kind of do all, all the work for you, but don't trust it entirely, so. So let's make sure. So it's going to look at what we're going to try and do, and it's going to do a few other things for us as well. Not only is it going to look at, um, not only is it going to look at whether the primers will dimerize with each other, or whether they'll successfully bond to the sequence that we're trying to amplify, but they'll also look at things like uh, will it 
also amplify something on a whole different chromosome, somewhere all the way on the other side. So when you do this, you're going to be using a whole human genome DNA as the template. So that's three billion base pairs to check. So it's going to take it a minute to check and make sure that it comes up with a primer that will bind to the thing we're looking for and not bind to a whole bunch of other stuff. So uh, it's going to try and make specific primers uh, that will stick to our stuff and not everything in the genome. And so you just got to let it work. Let's see. Uh, what else can we talk about? I'll talk a little bit about ordering primers. But using something like this will, will make it easier. But let's say you're using this method. One mistake a lot of people make is they get confused on the three prime, five prime stuff. And so if you look at this one, you say, okay, the top is usually pretty easy. And you'll say, oh, well, here's my sequence, right? T, 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 blah, blah, blah. And you'll go to a, a, an oligo manufacturing company, right? So you'll go to somewhere like IDT, or you'll go to Elim Bio, or Fisher, or a bunch of other places, and you'll say, all right, make me this oligo. And they're going to want it. The, the standard way to express DNA sequences is 5 prime on the left to 3 prime. So when you look at this one, T, 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 and it would read down this way. But if you look at this one, you say, all right, C, the bottom strand is C, T, A, T, but that's not how you want to send it to them. If you send it to them this way, they'll make your primer backwards. They'll make this the five prime end, and this the three prime end, which is backwards. So you see this is stuck to the bottom? This is the five prime end, so this is the order you send it to. Now, if you're using something like SnapGene, just open it up, and that's the sequence you want to use. So, if you go here, you can go primers, and then this is the correct five prime to three prime orientation for all these primers. So what you'll do is you'll copy it just like this over to the website of the company that makes it. If you pull it out of, if you pull it out of here, and you just copy that bottom strand the way it looks, uh, it won't it won't give you uh, what you want. You'll have a primer that's uh, facing the wrong direction. It won't amplify anything. Um, so let's look at our primer results. OK, so they've come up with a, a variety of options for us. So this is GenBank. Now, this particular gene has a lot of uh, different regions. And so it, they gave us different options. So we could pick different areas that we wanted to uh, we wanted to amplify uh, but in this case they just are focusing up here and we can pick this primer pair and it'll amplify this region so if say we wanted to get this exon then it would uh, any of these would work and we could look at things like uh, the cost of the primers or whatever but honestly primers are fairly cheap and even the calculated uh, results don't really tell you a lot uh, they're sort of theoretical, and biology doesn't like to comply with theory, so it never hurts to have two or three options. So these primers will be slightly different. Uh, if we go down here, we can take a look. So here's primer pair number one. This is the forward primer, this is the reverse primer, and remember, this will be in the correct five prime to three prime orientation. So if you copy from here and paste it, uh, it will, you know, this one will be right, and this one will be right, and, and you can just put those straight in the thing, because they've already made that adjustment. Now, it's going to tell you some things. 20, 20 bases, 21 bases, um, their melting temperatures, their CG percentage, how much is CG and how much is AT, uh, their self-complementarity, and so they've already sort of designed all this stuff, and then you've got another option, primary pair 2, 3, 4, and so on. And you can pick... Maybe you want to pick two or three different primer pairs because you can do these two together, or you could do this one and this one and this one and this one and so on. So you've got a, plenty of options to try and um, solve any problems you may run into. So, sorry. Uh, let's see. So when you're going for uh, primer... Uh, ordering, 
you know, you can you can take uh, a few different options, and price is one thing because mostly um, uh, these guys are generally the same. But there are primary modifications that you can do if you're trying to do some of the more advanced PCR stuff, because PCR has a lot of different uh, potential uses beyond just um, amplifying a piece of DNA and sending it off and getting it sequenced. That's a very important use and it can tell you a lot of things and a lot of um, a lot of the experiments that you'll do will end with PCR and sequencing uh, and that'll be the thing that tells you that it worked. But uh, you can do a lot of things with modified versions of PCR. You can do things where you can PCR, for example, uh, uh, RNA by first doing reverse transcription and using a different enzyme to turn RNA into DNA and then doing PCR and so you can amplify RNA or you can do things where you add things to the five prime end and so if you look at this primer I've got this end and it's stuck down but if I added something to the five prime end let's say now that doesn't anneal but it wouldn't affect my uh, it wouldn't affect my PCR necessarily because remember I'm extending from the three prime end onward. But what that would mean is my fragment of DNA that I created would now have this little piece sticking off of it, and that's uh, that's got a lot of useful applications because I can add, for example, uh, I can add a uh, a restriction site. So if I have a piece of DNA, like say I wanted to copy this whole gene and I wanted to stick it in uh, a plasmid. I could take my PCR uh, primer, I could add a restriction site, and one of the things that's important is if you take a restriction site like, uh, let's say this one, uh, let's use one more standard one. Why are they all the weird ones? Okay, let's use this one. All right, so uh, I can cut it with enzymes, and then I can paste that subclonant into another uh, piece of DNA. I can I can do uh, uh, I can make a transgenic molecule, right? So I can I can stick that in something, and so uh, if I do that, then I would take this sequence and I would add it to the five prime end of my of my uh, primer. In this case, I can just go copy. And then I would have my restriction site. But one thing to remember restriction enzymes are a physical molecule, right? So it's a, it's a piece of protein that needs to stick to this piece of DNA that you're going to make. And when you make that piece of DNA, uh, it's going to need somewhere to sit. So it pays to add a few more uh, nucleotides, usually I do about six, uh, to the back end. And that way, when you make the whole thing, you'll have this little piece and you'll have a restriction site sitting there and then you can cut it and use that it'll be sitting on the end and you can paste that into your uh, DNA of choice but uh, when you're doing regular PCR you don't add five prime modifications they call it there's a lot of them there's all kinds of stuff there's radio labeling there's fluorescent labeling there's um, you can add homology ends, so big pieces of DNA that are homologous to other pieces of DNA. If you're going to use PCR, for example, to generate uh, a template for a CRISPR reaction, or if you're going to use PCR to generate uh, something where you're going to use uh, recombineering to make uh, a recombinant whatever. So you can use PCR in a lot of really creative ways. Uh, in the foundation of this uh, technology is really just designing good primers uh, and uh, then taking the information that you have about this like the length of the piece that's being amplified which then tells you how long you're going to anneal and let's see this for example delete this real quick these two primers amplify a dog gene uh, called OXTR, which is a, actually it's not the gene, it's a, it's a region upstream of the gene from the dog genome that uh, has a mutation in it. And that mutation is right here. And so you can look at, in some dogs it's a G, in some, in some dogs 
uh, it's not a G. In other words, it's an AT. And so, uh, I don't remember which strand the G goes on. But uh, in the dogs uh, where it's mutated, uh, this affects the amount of um, oxytocin receptor that gets produced in their brain. So, if you can make primers that will amplify this whole section, so here's our primer number one, primer number two, we can amplify this whole section and then send it off for sequencing. And it's only about 800 bases. And then we can look at it when we get our sequencing results back and see what genotype that particular dog has. We can see whether they have this mutation or not. And it affects, that mutation affects how closely they bind to people, how much they want to be around people, and how much they feel that sort of bonded feeling by changing the amount of oxytocin receptors in their brain. So uh, it can give you information like that, but you may also want to use that to try and do a CRISPR modification, and you may want to use this as a template for doing that modification. So you've got a lot of power with PCR. PCR is probably the most powerful genetic engineering technology that was ever invented. Uh, and it was invented in 93. People get excited about CRISPR, but we wouldn't even know about CRISPR without PCR. Um, let's see, is there anything in the thing before we close out? Just make sure I didn't skip anything. Let's see. Okay, well here's an example, okay. This is using GenBank. Uh, okay, you can read that. Hopefully not get confused by my pushing the wrong button earlier. Okay. But this is the core of it. You, uh, the actual lab work is really easy. You design your primers, they arrive, they'll be dry. You'll dilute the primers by just adding water, and uh, this probably isn't the best place to go over that, but uh, basically you're just going to look at the amount of primer that you have, uh, and you'll add the right amount of water to get the uh, primers to the right dilution, and then you're going to just be adding small amounts of liquid. So you're going to take something, uh, I think there's, so a typical PCR reaction is going to look something like this. You're going to take a tiny tube, you're going to add a small amount of water, about 21 microliters. Oh, hold on. Let's go up here. Okay, this one. So the water is going to have, uh, in this case, this is a 50 microliter reaction. You can also do 25s and different sizes. Uh, but sometimes they, it does change the outcome if it scales differently. 37 microliters um, in this particular reaction, one microliter of your forward primer, uh, diluted to 300 nanomolar, uh, one microliter of your reverse primer, uh, and then the DNA template can vary wildly, like orders of magnitude. Some PCR reactions want you to use teeny tiny amounts, and some want you to use huge amounts, and that's because you're measuring it in mass, so it's grams, and grams doesn't tell you much about how many copies of your template there really are. Because if you're doing human genomes, they're much heavier than uh, plasmids. So if you're using a plasmid as your template, you've got billions and billions and billions of copies if, for you know, one nanogram. And if you're using a human genome, you've got far less. Just like if you fill, if you have five, if you have say 50 pounds of ping pong balls is a lot more balls than 50 pounds of basketballs. It's just because you're weighing it that doesn't tell you how many copies of the template you have. So generally if you're using a smaller piece of DNA you use a little less. If you're using a bigger piece of DNA uh, you use a little more. But it's pretty tolerant. Usually it doesn't matter that much how much you use. Theoretically one molecule is enough to get one going but in practice that doesn't really work very good. So, this range is a pretty good range. Your master mixes, most of the time you'll see 5x master mixes, but sometimes you'll see 2x. So you'll have to make adjustments, because if this was a 2x, what you would do is instead of using 10 microliters, because this is 5x in 50 total, you'd use 25, and you would reduce this by the difference. So you'd use less water, and basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna add uh, the water. You're going to add the primers and the template and the master mix and it should all add up to the total volume that you're shooting for and then you pop it in your thermocycler. Uh, and there's 
a lot of uh, different versions, Use a pretty standard reaction, just runs through the cycles we talked about earlier, but there's also advanced things like you can do touchdown PCR, which slowly works towards the annealing temperature if you're having specific kinds of trouble. Um, you can also do things like um, uh, hot start and all these other things. So there's a bunch of different versions of it, but sort of get the core PCR reaction down because you'll use it a lot and you'll use um, uh, a lot of modified versions of it uh, to do a whole lot of things, a whole lot of things. You can do uh, assembly, subcloning, and manufacturing it and do it all in PCR. Um, you can do a lot of things in molecular biology with PCR. And I think that's ge generally the gist of everything. Were there any questions? Oh, we lost audio. Is everybody hearing me okay? How much for a pair of primers, both 20 bases long? Usually they're pretty cheap. As far as like uh, money, you're talking like $6, $7, depending on who's making it. Um, uh, usually the shipping cost is more than the actual primer itself. So if you're getting primers made and you get uh, a couple of primers that are about 20 bases long, uh, the shipping is going to be like 30 bucks and the primers both of them together will be less than that so uh, usually it pays to get a few more primers than you need uh, rather than uh, get the get the primers find out that your primers have an issue and then order more primers and pay shipping twice uh, let's see let me switch it back to Alright, can everybody hear me? I heard I, I say I lost audio a while back. Okay, any other questions before we go? Let me give it a second because I think the, question, the uh, text thing is slow. Check my notes here, make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah. Okay. Well, it seems like that's probably everything. Um, anything you want to add, Josiah? Okay, well I guess that's the end of it. Alright, uh, I think the next 